Hello, my name is Alan Tannenbaum. I'm a photojournalist. I hope everybody is enjoying Keith Haring, Radiant Gamut, at the World Chess Hall of Fame in St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, it's an honor for me to be a part of this exhibition with my photographs of Keith Haring taken back in the early 80s. And to have my photographs among Keith's amazing works and the other objects and chess sets and everything else that you're able to see there in the museum. How did I meet Keith? I used to work for a newspaper called the Soho Weekly News starting back in 1973. And one of my interests was the art world. Um, that might have something to do with the fact that I was an art major in college after trying other majors and gravitating to Soho. But that was my home for over eight years. And I covered the art world, the music scene, nightlife, uh, politics, show business, you name it. So I had one of the best jobs in New York City. And it really taught me how to become a good photographer and photojournalist and to work for publications. Sadly, the paper closed in uh, March of 1982. So I had to find a new direction. There was a photo agency called Sigma that I started working with, but I still had to be entrepreneurial and find my own stories. And being interested in the arts, I was certainly aware of artists like uh, Kenny Scharf and Keith Haring. Keith got his start doing graffiti in the subways, taking the boards that were usually used for uh, advertisements. When there was no advertisements on them, they were black, and he would make these line drawings with uh, chalk. And um, gradually his work progressed until he became known for his paintings, which were uh, animated figures and people and drawing on pop culture. And um, he became more and more well-known. So I thought, well, I think Keith Haring would be a good story for me to do um, with pictures to tell his story as as an artist. So I got in touch with him and uh, of course things were a lot easier to uh, organize and arrange than they are now, but um, Keith was receptive. He knew my work from the Soho News and he was a nice guy and he thought that I would be helpful to him in documenting his work in a way that uh, would bring it to a wider audience. So we met up a few times and uh, I photographed him working on his famous mural, which was uh, on the corner of uh, East Houston and Bowery in Lower Manhattan. And I also went to his uh, studio where he was working on some big pieces. And uh, those are the mostly red and yellow and black pieces you see. Then I covered a couple of his uh, exhibitions, went to the openings in 82 and 83 at the Tony Schifrazi Gallery. Tony was a visionary gallery dealer and he certainly knew that uh, Keith's work would be interesting and exciting for all generations. So that's how I did it and uh, basically I think I got a lot of great photos and Keith was receptive and uh, personable and in addition to showing him at work, you could see his personality, uh, which was uh, open and, and uh, you know, forthcoming. So it was a real privilege also to be able to work with him and do these photos uh, that you can see now in the museum. It's one of my proudest collections of photographs of artists that I've done. And I photographed a lot of artists from Andy Warhol to Jasper Johns to Robert Rauschenberg and you know part of that whole pop art scene so you know I think Keith actually comes is, is derived from the uh, the pop art movement of the 50s and 60s and um, he uses a lot of those elements and certainly like pop art did Keith's work captures a popular uh, uh, imagination and it's well loved and used in not only in fine art, but in objects and uh, 
collectibles and all kinds of things that have his famous style and his imprint and his amazing designs. So I'm very happy that uh, I was able to do this work and create these photographs of a wonderful artist and a, and a great human being. And it was very tragic that he died so young from complications due to the AIDS uh, virus. And that's a very sad thing because we lost the great artist way too soon. In terms of the openings, they were exciting events. Uh, I just discovered a new photograph, which I'll have to share with you, um, from looking at black and white contact sheets of pictures that I did at his 82 opening at Tony Schifrazi. And one of them is this great shot of Keith releasing balloons that have his uh, signature uh, three-eyed face on them, along with uh, another one of my favorite artists, from that period. Actually, he still is one of my favorite artists, Kenny Scharf, who's also a super nice guy. And um, it's exciting when I discover these uh, images in, in my collection. But, uh, you know, these events were really big, well attended, and uh, very exciting and, and fun. One of the places where Keith's work uh, found a home soon after uh, this, another venue, it was the Fun Gallery, um, which was owned and run by Patty Astor on the Lower East Side. It was on East 10th Street. And the Fun Gallery was, you know, their premise was art is fun. Art can be fun. And their events were, were interesting and special. And, you know, these things were well attended by people who were interested in the arts, but the, the entire hip scene of New York City from that time. And that scene was an interesting conglomerate. I think it's kind of atomized now because Soho and downtown New York was a big center of the arts. Uh, you had loft spaces that were inexpensive. And not only artists such as painters and sculptors could get these uh, big spaces to do their work, but there were dance companies and, and uh, videographers and filmmakers and theater groups and uh, performance artists. So these spaces were inexpensive and accessible and they created, since they were concentrated in a neighborhood like Soho or moving to the East Village and the Bowery, uh, a sense of community and provided for like cross pollinization of uh, ideas and, uh, and I shouldn't forget the music scene which was enormous in New York City then and you know places like CBGB's and the whole punk scene and all of these were uh, intermixed you know the people from all scenes would go to the different clubs like the Mud Club which was uh, in Tribeca or below Canal Street uh, which was an interesting fascinating mix of people from punks to artists to models to you know musicians and there were bands, there were theme parties, there were all kinds of interesting things going on. And, you know, sooner or later you'd see somebody interesting. That was my favorite hangout back in the late 70s, early 80s. As I mentioned, I did other work besides uh, working with artists. I'm most well known for my pictures of musicians, especially rock musicians. Um, I was really in the right place at the right time since the scene in New York was so exciting. Everything from arenas like Madison Square Garden and concerts like Rolling Stones, Led Zeppelin, The Who, to the small clubs like uh, CBGB's where I photographed the Ramones and um, John Cale and Nico, to places like uh, Central Park where I photographed B Blondie and Peter Tosh. You had the whole mix. And so not just rock, which was... Uh, I've always loved rock and roll since I was a kid in the 50s, but jazz and hanging out at these jazz clubs with some of the greats like Cannonball Adderley and um, Charlie Mingus and uh, Dizzy Gillespie, but uh, others, you know, other music such as reggae, meeting Bob Marley and Toots and the Maytals. It was a fantastic time, and I was really lucky to have this job where I could do all these music. Uh, photographs and um, you can see many of them on my walls in my studio uh, and appointment gallery today. 
So that was uh, some of the other things that I did. I also got to photograph movie stars like Jack Nicholson, be on movie sets, and uh, cover the politics of the time and lifestyle. New York was an interesting place in the 70s and early 80s in that the city was essentially broke. There's a famous headline, Ford, President Ford to city, dropped dead. There was a lot of dirt, crime, all of these other things, but you didn't need a lot of money to live, not at all. Rents were cheap, everything else was inexpensive. And in spite of like the, the danger and the dirt and the uh, all the political problems, uh, there was so much going on, the city was extremely exciting and everything was accessible. So it was a great time in New York City and a lot of the things that we enjoy today were really created in in the 70s and, and early 80s. So Keith, his work was part of this uh, cross-pollinated music scene, the punk scene and everything else, but also coming up at this time was the uh, rap and hip-hop. It was a new phenomenon and uh, you know, um, mixed in with the skateboard scene, and Keith embraced all of this. So at his openings, for example, there would be a DJ playing a lot of the hip-hop hits of the time and, you know, spinning the disc, scratching, all of that. And uh, Keith was definitely into the music and the music scene, which uh, unfortunately, sadly, doesn't really exist that much in New York today. But back then, if you liked music, there were all these venues and bands and exciting things to go see and hear and do. I got started in photography when I was living in San Francisco in the 1960s. Somehow I just got inspired and I bought a camera and there was a, a, a recreation city, a recreation center run by the city of San Francisco that had uh, studios and dark rooms and it cost ten dollars a year to join so I was able to learn how to uh, develop film and to make prints. And this is an important skill, which is kind of lost today, but I think it was an important part of uh, being a photographer. And uh, so I taught myself, basically, how to take pictures. Um, I wound up going to graduate school in film at San Francisco State, um, but wound up concentrating more on my photography. In the fall of 68, I went to a Jimi Hendrix concert that was I used to go to all the big shows there and saw all the bands like the Doors and Grateful Dead but you know I and Janis Joplin but I went to this Hendrix concert actually saw him three times this one I brought my camera and I shot some color film that was the first time I photographed at a, at a concert and and got some good shots actually it was <laughs> pretty funny how I did it but Coming back to New York to try to get started after teaching at Rutgers for a couple of years I, uh, in filmmaking and photography, I went to get a job at an eight-page giveaway paper called the Soho News. I had been struggling to try to find work, went to wire services, photo agencies, newspapers, no luck. So this, since I was hanging out in Soho, I discovered the Soho News. It was brand new, and um, I went to see the publishers uh, at his office in, in Soho. And he flipped through my portfolio, and uh, he stopped at the picture of Hendrix that I had done in 1968, and he said, you know, I used to be Hendrix's publicist. And I said, wow, that's really cool. It was true. And so after he finished flipping through the rest of my book, he said, yeah, you know how to take pictures. I'm giving you an assignment. We pay $5 a picture. If I like your work, I'll put you on staff for $40 a week. And I walked out of his office and I said, yes. <laughs> this was the break, this little break that I've been waiting for. Well, my first assignment was the Avant-Garde Art Festival at Grand Central. I did a good job. He liked the work, so he said, I'm, I'm going to put you on staff. And I said, well, okay, Michael, that's great, but, you know, this... It's only $40 a week, and, you know, this film and paper and chemicals, they're expensive. So, um, you know, I would like to be on the masthead of the paper as a photo editor, and he said yes. Uh, and I said, you're going to pay for all those materials, and he said yes. And then I said, and I own all the negatives, and he agreed to that. Smartest thing I ever said, because... 
that's what I'm doing now. I'm working with my negatives and contact sheets and making prints, and basically I've established myself as a fine art photographer, and I'm able to uh, make a, a living selling my photographs that I did 40-odd uh, years ago as fine art prints, limited edition, archival, signed, fine art prints. So thank you, Michael Goldstein, and thank you, Soho News, for, for that. I am still working on projects and photo projects and books and working on a documentary film right now. And I also license my photographs to books, magazines, newspapers, films, um, because I have a lot of history, which I've been, you know, consolidating and working on and indexing and cataloging. So all of this work is accessible to people who are looking for it. So. <laughs> You know, I just watched the John Lurie specials on HBO, and he was talking about the ability to talk into a, a camera when there's nobody else there, and how it was really a really terrible thing to do. And and the the, the more you did it, the better you got at it. The, the worse kind of person you are. Well, that's not my case. That's his case. <laughs> but. Anyway, back to the stories. So from getting my start back in the 60s and learning how to take pictures and develop film and make prints to getting my job at the Soho News and learning how to work at a publication and put out a newspaper every week and cover every kind of story to then going on to an uh, international photo agency and doing stories all over the world, whether it was uh, the war in in the, the Gulf or a, a volcanic disaster in South America uh, or conflict in the Middle East and, you know, apartheid in South Africa. I learned how to do everything and and would come back here and do a, stories in New York. It could be a fashion show. Uh, so, you know, I became a very versatile photographer and that's why I have this body of work and I've also done four books, the first of which is called New York in the 70s, and I did a book on John Lennon and Yoko Ono because I had exclusive photographs of John and Yoko just before he was killed in 1980, which was one of the saddest things that happened in my life, but I have these wonderful photographs and memories. And um, Grit and Glamour, which was about the style scene, and now I'm working on a new book on the music scene and one on the nightlife scene. So. I'm busy. I'm busy. Thank God for that. And uh, it's very exciting to be able to work with this archive and talk about people like Keith Haring and to work with the people at the World Chess Hall of Fame in St. Louis. And again, I'm grateful for that uh, opportunity and uh, hope to be able to continue for as long as possible working with my pictures and working with my photographs and doing these kinds of things. So I thank everybody for their kind attention. Please enjoy the uh, exhibition and uh, look forward to seeing you down the road. Mm -hmm.